whole fast for a minute. Check, check, check. Mm. Whoa, 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 whoa. This leaves, I was just doing all that stuff for that. And why? Why what? Mm. Oh, like, brand new mic. So. <laughs> all right, I am almost ready. I'm almost ready. I'm trying to get to the live so I can share the video. Are we live? Yes. Can somebody, oh, there we go. Do you want that? Um, you want that Snapple in the? You oh, I don't mind it. Okay. I mean, Snapple is my drink. You okay. know, right. it's like my Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. <laughs> Woo! Give me a second. But I'm not on live yet. Nope. All right. Yeah. Can they hear us? Can you hear? Everybody out there, are you listening? 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 Um, listening, 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 give me a half second, and I'm going to get us straight. I just want to share it to you. Mm, the delay. Uh, delay. Because of this microphone inside of here, and we can't turn this microphone off, because if I turn it off in live, it'll affect the recording. You can't just take it out and put the other mic in? It, it Why would it change that? Because this is coming from this mic, right? No, no. What? Let's just okay. record and then we... Oh, All right. Uh, Same question that was last week. Like, that's what I'm saying, we got to... No, but it, it, it's, it's you, the only the only way you can avoid that is to move like what we did. I got to move all the way over here so she won't get the delay because other than that, this microphone is too close. Gotcha. So it's giving her a delay, right? All right, let us... All right, y'all, we are ready in three, 1,000, two, 1,000, one, 1,000, let's go live. Switch me on, Greg. Gotcha. <whistles> dun, 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 dun. We didn't have the dark, scary music today, did we? Um, did not. That's okay. We'll figure it out. We'll make all right, it is your man May Shackson with the latest edition of Illinois Minotti. Take a moment, share the broadcast, share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with everyone that you know. This is the Illinois Minotti live broadcast right here today. We are getting it in. Uh, you know what? I was trying to decide if I was going to get 
dressed up and jazzy today if I was going to sit back. My Actually, I was planning on another set. I was planning on sitting on the, on the stool and being on a high joint, but what wound up happening uh, was our videos, the, our uh, director's chairs did not come in. But stay tuned because next week we'll be having a whole different look and a whole different set. Yo, what's up? This is your man, Maze Jackson, with the epi season two, episode two of Illinois Minati, the podcast, Inside. Inside Illinois, poli inside Illinois Political Secret Society. Now, y'all, I'm going to tell y'all what. I am enjoying this uh, podcast, but I'm going to do some housekeeping first. First of all, I want to welcome you to episode two of season two, episode two of Illinois Minati, Inside Illinois uh, Political Secret Society. Uh, I am Maze Jackson, host of the WVON Morning Show with Maze Jackson featuring uh, my co-host, Sonia Escobar and sometimes Ty Stroger. Sonia is in the building with us, uh, as well as my man Big Greg, G Reg, and Big Swill in the building, also on my production team. Hey, I want to encourage you all to tune in every Thursday night uh, through the end of the legislative session. That's right, till May 31st. Tune in every Thursday night so you can understand what is going on in Illinois politics and how it affects us. Speaking of Springfield, big shout out to State Representative Cam Buckner with the What's In It For The Black People Bill, House Bill 4865. Uh, we are seeing shout out to Jahan Gordon Booth, who is also uh, representing. She is also a chief co-sponsor. Hey, did you see Mary Flowers joined on as a chief co-sponsor? Now, when I go down there, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to save that for right now because she on my bill. Um, so I want to encourage everybody. I'm looking forward to the Black Caucus joining us. All right. Also, while we're at it, I want to take care of just a little bit more housekeeping. Um, let's get this out of the way. Please take a moment and like the Maze Jackson page. Don't just watch it. Don't just follow it. Like it. Like the What's In It For The Black People page. Follow me at Maze Jack. That's at M-A-Z-J-A-C on Twitter. Or you can get me at Maze Jackson Sid on Instagram. Also, Check out May said on, check out, also check out May said on SoundCloud where you can get the, check out May said on SoundCloud where you can get the um, podcast. podcast. All right, I'm gonna adjust this mic a little bit cause you making me nervous. Get it out there a little bit more, get a little bit more action. Is that cool? Guess next time we'll do the set with me in the chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Perfect practice make perfect, right? Perfect practice make perfect. All right. So when we last left off, we left you on a cliffhanger, a cliffhanger. Uh, some of you all were tuned in because you wanted to find out who exactly the mole was. But as you found out, the Illinois Minati was working against our internet connection last night in our last week, so I decided to go ahead and share the information with you, but you gotta get on the podcast. Now, you're probably saying, where do I get this podcast? Right now, you can go to the May, to May Said on SoundCloud, and you can download the podcast, and you too can find out who the mole was. Now, I'm also let you know, I show pictures of the mole on the WBON Morning Show this week, so if you watch the Facebook Live broadcast, you will be able to see it. Uh, now, as I mentioned last week on Thursday, uh, if you recall last Thursday, remember I hinted that there might be a St. A Valentine's Day massacre, massacre that next Friday. I said that there might be some indictments coming down. I thought it was going to be a lot more, but apparently there was only one, and that was the indictment of um, government official Pat Doherty. Now, before you ask, now before you ask, who is Pat Doherty? Let me answer. Uh, Pat Doherty is a friend of mine, right? He's a friend of mine. You all know I don't deny my friends in the game. I, if you if you've been my friend, you've been my friend. I'm not going to deny you, even if you get in trouble. And it seems like Pat's in some real trouble right now. Uh, but I think that when we look at Pat Doherty and the trouble that he is in. It'll give us a great insight into how this system works. Um, why don't we do this? Let's switch back over to, okay, so check it out. 
So it'll give us great insight into how this system actually works. Um, Pat Doherty uh, was a friend of mine, but the reason he was a friend of mine is because he's a numbers guy, right? And Pat was the guy when I was involved in elections, when I was involved in elections, who oftentimes was the guy who put the math to my theories on politics. Does that make sense? So Pat, I, when I first got in the game, I met Pat as uh, a numbers guy. Now when I say a numbers guy, I mean in every election there are people who do a variety of different things. Um, and those people, um, a lot of the people oftentimes do a variety of different things. Let me do something real quick. I want to go to, let's take a quick commercial break, go to the Illinois Minotti screen for me, and then I'll be right back, guys. We want to just make sure we got everything proper for you. So did we go back? Did we switch it? All right. I'll be right back. Come back. You already there? I'm not back. I'm waiting on the. You know. All right, we're back. Pardon the technical difficulties, y'all. We are working out some of our technical dis difficulties, but we're back, back, back. So I was telling you as I left, Pat Doherty was my numbers guy. And when you, in politics, there's a variety of people in the campaign, right? So there is the fundraising crew. There is the um, people who do field work, there are people who do communications, but to win a campaign, you need a path to victory. And oftentimes, the path to victory is defined by the numbers guy. Pat Doherty was one of the premier numbers guys in the game. Quite frankly, he was actually the guy, like I told you before, who put the math to my theories, right? I used to say, Pat, this is how such, I can believe that this person is going to win the election. And Pat would say, Maze, uh, you know, you got a good theory here. And I would say, well, this is what I think, and this is how the numbers would break out, etc. And Pat would then say, Maze, I think your theory is right, and here's how you get here. And so essentially what Pat would do was go to campaigns and help them figure out how many votes they needed to get from every area to be successful in a campaign. That makes sense? So Pat, as the numbers guy, uh, I'm gonna tell you, I'll tell you a secret. Pat was the num when I first got really credible as a political pundit, was during the Bruce Rauner campaign because I was really the only black person who said, I was really one of the only pundits who thought that Bruce Rauner was going to win uh, and I said why. I called it at about three o'clock that day um, after checking some math, notes and math, I called up Pat and said, Pat, I think Bruce Rauner's really going to win this election. Pat gave me the math 
By 4 o'clock, we had called the race, and guess what? Bruce Browner won. Now, that made a lot of people mad at me because they were like, oh, you're a Republican, you're a Republican. I was like, no, I'm just calling it as I see it. And I knew that the enthusiasm for Pat Quinn had fallen, and there was some enthusiasm for Rauner in the suburbs and the white parts of Cook County. Now, I think about that often because I also think that that plays into, uh, I think that also plays into this whole situation. All right, then I'll tell you the other big race that we called together. It was the Trump race. Uh, I was one of the very few black people who said that Trump was gonna win. And as a matter of fact, when you say something like that, people were getting offended. They were saying, there's no way. And I'll just, re I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. You know, uh, Robbie Mook, who, is the, who was the chairman or the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton, there's a very big donor who I would say every day, man, Hillary Clinton's gonna lose, Hillary Clinton's gonna lose, Hillary Clinton's gonna lose. Um, and in the process of Hillary Clinton saying that Hillary Clinton was gonna lose, they flew Hillary Clinton's team in to see me and for me to explain what happened. And can I tell you what? Nobody believed me. And I told all of their staff, I was like, I'm telling you the enthusiasm in the black community is down. Now, Illinois, we don't always see that, but in other states, and the places I called it, Philadelphia, Detroit, and Milwaukee, were places where black people were not feeling uh, the Democrats. I'm gonna tell you, I feel the same thing as well. Can you do me a favor, guys, to my production team? Can you raise that camera up? Um, Cause I'm, uh, it's like looking at my knee. So bring it, bring it up to me. All right, so while you're working on that, um, Pat knew his stuff. He knew his stuff for real. Pat learned, and you know why Pat knew his stuff? He learned it from the greatest, one of the best political minds in Illinois. And that was the mind of Jeremiah Joyce, uh, one of the five families of Beverly. We'll do them one day on a podcast. Can I tell you, the five, actually, and I, shout out to Mike Joyce, who was very helpful to me. Uh, but since Pat, since the Joyce is basically retired to Florida, it left Pat without a political patch, a patron and no political home. You know, most of us call ourselves coming from um, someone politically, right? We, we often say that we come from someone politically. Well, when the Joyce's kind of moved to Florida, they wound up leaving Pat without a place. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you all. I thought that all Pat really ever did I thought that all Pat ever really did was sit around and pontificate uh, politics with me. But one day when I showed up at the office of Senator Sandoval, I realized that there was something different. I realized that Pat wasn't just my numbers guy. He was a numbers guy for a lot of people. But that role as a numbers guy is how it was actually how we got to where we are today. So let's do this. Um, let me tell you a little, so y'all wanna know how I met Pat? I mean, not met Pat, but y'all wanna know kind of what race I saw him on? What's up? What's oh, <laughs> I'm just seeing y'all faces. Y'all know I'm looking at y'all and I'm like, what's up? Okay. And so as you all react and say stuff, I'm looking. So anyway, Pat Doherty, uh, so do, let me go backwards. I don't know if you all know that in 2010, I was, after winning on Pat Quinn's campaign, I was hired as a lobbyist by what was one of the premier lobbying firms in Illinois, that being the Roosevelt Group. Uh, and at the Roosevelt Group, I was working with Mike Noonan and Victor Reyes, who will, as we unroll this thing, will play heavily into this situation, right? They'll, they'll, their names will start to come up a lot more in this scenario, but Mike and Vic, along with a large contingent of Latino power brokers, had decided that they wanted to elect Silvana Tavares to the state representative seat that uh, Rudy Lozano Jr. was looking to run for. Now, essentially what, so what essentially happened was the Roosevelt Group got together with Senator Sandoval 
and a crew of Latinos, and they put together a team that they thought would be capable of electing uh, Silvana Tabaras to, uh, to her position as a state rep. And let me tell y'all what, that was really one of the first times when I saw how hard the Latinos, when they want to win, can go out. I hadn't seen anything like it since HDO. But in that meeting, when I walk in, there's Senator Sandoval, there's Mike, Mike Noonan, there's Victor Reyes, uh, there is a few Latino power brokers. And then in the background, there is Irish Pat Doherty with his white hair. And I walk in and I say, Pat, what are you doing here? I thought you were my guy. And what I learned on that day was that he wasn't just, while he was pontificating with me, he was out doing his work for other people. So I tell you this story because Pat Doherty essentially became the numbers guy for the Roosevelt Group on elections. So that, my friends, is Pat Doherty, right? So I told you we're going to talk about three people. Right. Pat Doherty, Tobolsky, who was the mayor of McCook, and the lobbyist. So I've already introduced you to Pat Doherty, and I've introduced you to the lobbyist, but I haven't introduced you to Jeff Tobolsky. Well, when I introduce you to Jeff Tobolsky, then hopefully all of this will make sense. Now let me back up though. Remember I told you on campaigns everybody's got a role, there's people and everybody's got a role? Well, here's what happened. Usually in a campaign, let me back up. When I was taught campaign work in the beginning, I was always taught never take money from the candidate. Why not take money from the candidate? Because if you help a candidate win, then they owe you way more than money than any money they could ever pay you. So when I first got into the game, I always said I won't take any money from a politician. Now I'm gonna tell you, working with black politicians, they'll take all your help and then forget about you. So in dealing with black campaigns, I started with the exception of my wife and my good friend Walter Burnett. I say, now if you want my help on a campaign, you gotta pay me up front. But that's not really how it's supposed to work. And at the lobbying firm, they were old school. Here's what they said. They said, if we elect the elected official, then we own that elected official. And so as we lobby in our practice, then guess what? When we go to ask them to do things for us, they'll be obligated to do them because we got them elected. Does that make sense? So instead of taking the short money and saying, ooh, I got elected, so pay me $5,000, you say, you know what? You can't pay me to help you, but there's going to be a day. Remember in the Godfather, he said, there'll be a day when I will come and ask you for a favor. Remember that favor, because that favor is how you find out how all of these so-called consultants started fleecing the red light camera companies. All right, ready? Check this out. So now, Pat is working with the lobbyists, and there is a mayor, a gentleman named Jeff Tobolsky, who is running for mayor in a tiny town called McCook. Now, why does anybody want to be the mayor of a town like McCook with only less than 2,000 residents? Because guess what? It was a big trucking hub. And it was a big hub for industrial parks and people who pay a lot of taxes. But also, McCook was the home of Mike Vondra, the Asphalt King, who just so happened to be what? A client of who? The Roosevelt Group. Now, Remember how I tell you these things work. So now the Roosevelt Group decides to help elect the mayor of the town where one of their largest clients resides. Now, why do they want to elect the mayor of that town? Because if they elect the mayor of McCook, then their client, Mike Vondra, 
the asphalt king who has quarries in McCook, who has processing plants in McCook, could be really the boss of the town. If I fund the mayor and I fund his election, then I then can get can do kind of what I want to do in the town. Does that make sense? Okay. So now, so now the lobbyists come up with the idea of electing the mayor of McCook. And they want to elect their guy because it will help them with one of their very, very, very large clients. Now, let me back up so you all can understand that the Roosevelt Group was known for electing people or unelecting people depending. One of the members was the strategist being Victor Reyes. The other person, Mike Noonan, was a matagoon who then moved into a lobbyist, but he was a specialist in electing. The boy was good. He was good. And he was very effective in getting people elected. But as he got people elected, then guess what? They owed them. Right? Mm -hmm. So now, here's what we got. We got the lobbyists. We have their client, the Asphalt King, who has a business in McCook. They decide that they're going to elect the mayor of McCook so they can run the town and get their client whatever they want. Does that make sense? All right. Now, so that's where we are now. You know what, so, so now they are set to elect the mayor of McCook. Now, they've got one of the most wealthy businessmen in the area with the Asphalt King, who's willing to finance, fund all of the election raise the money for the mail, raise the money for door knocking, raise all of those funds, because if I own the town and I control it, guess what? That small investment of 50, 75, $100,000 will pay back millions in dividends because I get the access to the mayor. Is that making sense to everybody? Okay, whoever's got their phone on. His headphones are loud. So, I just want to make sure we're all on the same thing. Volume is fixed. Thank you, Sonia. All right. Is well, that what I said we should have did in the first place? Okay. <laughs> I'll stop. So, anyway, <laughs> check it out. So, check this out. So, now here we are. We're in McCook, right? The lobbyists have said to, they've gone to their client and said, we're going to need money to elect this guy, Jeff Tobolsky. But if we elect this guy, Jeff Tobolsky, then you will be the king of this area, right? Am I, are you getting it? And so essentially what happens is they then put a plan together to take over McCook. But who do you need if you're gonna win an election? You need a numbers guy. Remember that numbers guy I told you that I saw when I walked into Sandoval's office? Well, this was before and he had built a relationship, so now the lobbyists the lobbyists go to McCook no excuse me the lobbyists go and get a, a the numbers guy who is Pat Doherty and say Pat plot out our path to victory in this election Pat then sits down, puts the numbers together, gives them a plan to execute, tells them where they need to go get the votes, and voila, they elect the mayor of McCook, who happens to be who? Jeff Tobolsky. Now, Jeff Tobolsky, once the lobbyists elect the mayor of McCook, then guess what happens? They get, they go to the mayor of McCook and say, you're now the mayor, we helped you win, what can you do for us? So the first thing he says is, well, you can be the lobbyist for our town. Secondly, we'll take care of your guy, Mike Vondra. Third of all, we'll hire some of the people that you volunteered on our campaign staff to come work with us. And fourthly, beyond that, we'll give 
your numbers guy a job. And not only will we give your numbers guy a job, we'll give him the job as the chief of staff so that whenever you come, you don't even have to talk to me as the mayor. You can just talk to your guy that you put on. See how that works? So now, in the village of McCook, the lobbyists elected the mayor who then installed their numbers guy as his chief of staff. So guess what? At that point, you virtually control the town. Yeah. Um, and let's not use that map because that's the Tribune map. The pin map. Okay. That, use the other one with the Left. big ones yes. because okay. that's the map. That's the little map that the Tribune don't understand nothing. My map shows everything that happened. But let's just keep me on the stage for right now. All right. So now, here's where we're at. We're at the position now where Jeff Tobolsky is now the mayor of McCook, where he was helped to get elected by the lobbyists who upon election installed their guy as the chief of staff of the town. You with me? Now, at this point, they can go to Mike Vondra, who we've seen officers raided, and say, Mike, you got to run into town. You tell us anything you want. You can holler at us. And I'll tell you what, if you need... And, and essentially, now that he controls the... He is now has a great relationship with the mayor and controls the town. He can run amok. The lobbyists now are saying, boy, we've got a town that we've got the ability to run wild and our guy is in control. And then you've got Pat Doherty who now has a salary as a chief of staff, but he's also in a decision-making position. Enter the red light camera company. Back, remember the ed, the red light camera company, Safe Speed. Remember, I told you. Now, now I gotta go back because remember last week we talked about the Fetcher bill. So now, the lobbyists they now they got them cooked, but the lobbyists are always trying to eat up stuff. So they're always trying to find new business, new tactics, new ways to get business. Now, remember, I told you at the beginning of the year, they sit down and they look for people that they could target with Senator Sandoval, right? So Senator Sandoval, so they decide that this year, they're going to go after the red light camera companies. Now, why do they go after red light camera companies? Because the companies have to be controversial, right? So nobody cares about what happens to them. So now the lobbyists go to the senator to get a bill passed. And before they can propose a bill, another unwitting black senator poses a bill to take out the red light camera companies. So now, instead of them having to put up a fetcher bill, they can now charge a protection fee for as lobbyists, a legal protection fee, because they market the fact that they have the relationship with who? The head of the Department of Transportation, Senator Sandoval, who was in the process of creating a Fetcher bill, but instead of creating the Fetcher bill, because another senator went to ban it, he moved to protection. Am I making sense here? Because I don't know if I'm, I'm going too far. So now, as they're looking for protection... Senator Sandoval says, I'll be your protector. Right? Now, I just want to point out, McCook, you know where McCook is? In Senator Sandoval's district. His senatorial district. So now, Senator Sandoval is saying to, and then back up. Now the lobbyists are trying to figure out how to block the bill. Right? Now, the lobbyists have the relationship with Senator Sandoval, so they go to the red light camera company and say, hey, hire us, and we have a great relationship with the chairman of transportation, and we can help you save your business. And just like anybody who is in a trouble, you say, oh, my God, if you can help me save my business, I'll do whatever you tell me. Remember how I told you they create the crisis so they can get inside of the company? 
And then once they get inside the company, what do they do? They look around, they see how much money it is, and they assess how can they take this and spread this out amongst their people. So is this red light camera thing coming into view? So now you've got red light cameras, which are the way of the future. Because again, I keep telling you, I would much rather get a ticket in the mail than get stopped by a police officer in some of these towns. That's just me as a black man, but hey, that's a whole nother point, right? Would you rather, I mean, just think about all the black people you know, that anytime there are red, blue flashing lights in the back window, whatever it is, you got your hands and you are heart beating and all. I'm going to tell you what, I'd rather get the ticket in the mail, but that's a whole nother thing, and I'm going to be full disclosure. Um, I am doing work with Safe Speed, right? But I'm doing work with Safe Speed because I understand what is happening to them while and to help them navigate this space. Mm -hmm. I just always want to be honest with you all. I don't want you to be like, aha, aha, aha. You, I don't. So now here's where we at, yo. So now these guys are looking at this company and they're saying, how can we get more than just our $10,000 a month retainer? How can we tell everybody that we know and how can we get our friends paid off of this company so that we can, they can owe us even more? Ding, ding, ding. They, the lobbyists mm -hmm. then come up with the consultant program and go to the red light camera company and say, if you want to save your business, you should work with these consultants. Now, who are the consultants? They're people that worked on the campaign for them. But now, on top of it, the campaign, the, 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 the consultants, and this is where the consultants get greedy. The red light cameras provided safety and revenue in those communities. And I'm not going to back away from the revenue piece because there is a part that it does. But because they generate so much revenue, if you are dirty, you are looking for a way to access that money. And so what essentially happened was the lobbyists got together and came up with what they thought was a legal way to get their guys paid off of this company that they are rape, robbing, and pillaging. Remember remember, I told you last week when you got a Vic, you'd be like, oh, we got a Vic, and you try to open it up to everybody? Well, that's essentially what happened. Well, now, as you start to go around and look, then it just turns out that when you go to put the cameras in McCook, it turns out that the chief of staff of McCook is like, your lobbyists have told you, you should hire this guy. Mm -hmm. Your lobbyists say, hire this guy. Now, why would the lobbyists tell you to hire that guy? Because then they have, you pay them, and now you're forever indebted. The, the worker now works for free because you got him a contract making money on this deal. Does that make sense? So see, y'all, what happened was the lobbyists weren't content to just make their $10,000 a month. They wanted to figure out how they could get more of their friends to get in on this money. And so what they essentially did was come up with this consultant agreement that they drafted and gave to the, to the red light camera company and said, do this and this will save your business. Now, y'all, I'm going to be honest with you. The consultants saw the money that was being made and went to the lobbyists and said, get us a piece of that. And so the lobbyists put together this consultant agreement that was only available to who? People who worked with them or for them, right? So you help me on the campaign and I'll get you one of these consultant agreements. And so essentially what wound up happening was the lobbyists, and all of this, I'm telling y'all, this is all speculation, rumor, 
because obviously I'm alleging all this. I this is all this is you know I traffic and rumor and you end up. But remember those elected officials. So remember how how Pat Doherty helped get the mayor elected. And remember how I told you you never take money from the elected official because there will be a time when you can ask for something? Well, guess what? He asked to have the red light cameras put up in the towns. Knowing that he was going to get a cut from... He was going to get a cut because his lobbyists had negotiated. They shook the red light camera company and said, hey, now let me back up. Now, in all of this process, while all of this is happening, nobody would have been any of the wiser except for everybody thought that the, the Saudi Arabian was Italian. And so he got introduced to all the Italians and then realized who were the greedy people. And so when the feds came to the to the mole because they caught him up, they said, who could you possibly get? And he said, I got it. I'll give you Sandoval. Because Sandoval, he was, remember I told you last week, it would have all been good if he would have just stuck with the campaign contributions. But because he saw everybody else making money, he decided he wanted to put himself in. And so he asked for an envelope. And for 12 months, the feds took envelopes from him on camera. See how that worked? So let me help you understand. Let me just break this down for you because I, I don't want y'all to get lost. Pat Doherty was a numbers guy. Worked on elections. Middle class, middle, middle of the road guy. But he knew his stuff. He got connected with the lobbyists and helped them do their numbers for a lot of elections. In exchange for helping them in those elections, not only did they get him hired at in McCook, but they also thought about him as it relates to... Uh, they also thought about getting him hired when they got inside of the red light camera company and decided to rape, rob, and pillage it. Now, you'll also notice that there was Pat Doherty, there was Bill Helms, there were there were Johnny O'Sullivan. And can I tell you what? I have worked on campaigns with all of these guys. All of these guys. But I'll be honest with you. Black people never get those opportunities. Think about what's happening right now. Right? There's all the black people are, nobody black was seeing any of those opportunities. And because here's what happens. And even when you got to the black towns and suburbs and as you start to find out, guess what they did? The white guys would go help black mayors and black managers and black, and then guess what they would say? I, I want my favor. I want my favor. See y'all, you gotta understand that these lot, that the lobbyists, intent was to rape, rob, and pillage the companies, the controversial companies that they got. Now what is happening is Pat Doherty was indicted last Friday. But in his indictment last Friday, they had him on the phone offering to bribe a trustee from the town of Oak Lawn. Now, Here's the thing that is always puzzling to me. Why is it that all of the elected officials and their staff are the people getting caught and getting in trouble and the legislature is trying to regulate everybody but the people who did something wrong? See, I need for people to understand that right now in Illinois, oftentimes... Businesses are 
victims and they're set up to be victims in this state. See, Illinois, in a lot of cases, most of our elected officials look at our businesses. They look at a business as an opportunity for them to make money as well. As compared to, and don't get me wrong, I believe that you support the people that support you. I'm for campaign contributions. I'm for participating. But think about this. Think about when the state senator who is over the Department of Transportation decides that he is going to make that his personal piggy bank. And if you want to do business in this state, you got to cross by my path. So what is the choice? Do you not do business? See, the challenge that we have right now in Illinois is that I believe, y'all heard me say earlier today, perfect practice makes perfect. It's because I believe fundamentally that we have learned, the politicians in Illinois have essentially learned the wrong way. When your leader, and I'm gonna tell you guys as these, as this continues to unfold, you will see this same exact pattern every single time. You will find that there is a lobbyist, that elected elected official, and the lobbyist holds that elected official, not even holds them hostage, but develops a partnership in some cases. Now, in a lot of cases, there are good partnerships. I want to be clear. I have a lot of great working relationships with elected officials, and those are good. Unfortunately for black folks, though, we don't have the money relationships. When it's time for, and if you pay attention, think about this. Can I help y'all understand they victimized a black company? Like they didn't go after none of the white boys because the, they didn't go after none of the white companies because they knew they had the perfect combination of a black woman with a company who was controversial, who would do whatever she needed to do to save her business, right? So... When you have that combination of people, when you have that combination of circumstances, then you are in a perfect place to be leveraged. Am I making sense here? See, y'all got to understand that there are good lobbyists and there are lobbyists who look to take advantage of people. Can I tell you what, as a lobbyist, I made a great living. Can I tell you what, some, sometimes, you know, there are people, like the lobbying firm I worked with, hey man, they had at least 20 clients paying $10,000 a month. Think about that. At least 20 clients paying $10,000 a month. Not to count the fact that they had a law firm that was getting tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars from ComEd under legal fees. Mm. See, guys, the Illinois Minotti it's it really is a secret society. Y'all y'all ever pay attention on the morning show when I talk to Todd? And Todd was our highest ranking black person at one point and he has no clue this is not a diss this is how secret the society is and how we as black people have been left out right now I'm going to tell you what as you watch this as we're watching this podcast I'm going to guarantee you that there are white folks from Springfield who are watching right now who have made tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on their relationships with black people See, understand, y'all understand that, check this out. Do you understand that most black elected officials are elected by white operatives? And guess what they do? Those white operatives elect, help elect black elected officials. And it's not by fault of the black elected officials because we don't have a lot of people that know how to do the shit. And we don't have a lot of money. But what happens is, if you're a lobbyist and you've helped 
10, 12, 13 black elected officials get elected, when the white people come see you, guess what? You be like, thank you. What can I do to help you? Conversely, as black folks, there's not a lot that we can do to help the politician economically or on the ground because Madigan has made sure that there are limited black people that understand the election process. So now we are caught in a conundrum because we can't even really help our black elected officials at the levels that they need to be helped. And the white boys have the money and the relationships and the elect and the access that then essentially freezes us out even from our own black elected officials. You, it's not that black elected officials be like, ooh, I just want to help the white boys. It's like that white boy has helped me. He had a relationship. I'll never forget, man. I think about the lobbying firm that I worked for. And Esther Golar was one of the sweetest women I ever met in my life. She was a state rep. She sang gospel music. She, and you know, I will never forget how they talked about her as a person. Like, they was like, she is the sweetest, but they always talked about how they basically owned her because they got her elected. And she would do whatever. And they could get her to vote against things that were good for us because they got her elected. And they could always rationalize it. And if somebody helped you get elected that you you feel obligated, right? Unless it's somebody black. But here's the thing. If they didn't get their help, then they were willing to go against her and punish her. And they knew it. And there's no way to defend yourself. Because how many black people you know with the money to win, to invest $50,000? And the lobbyists are making... $50,000, $100,000 a month. Real talk. So the reason that I felt it was important for you to understand the relationship between Pat Doherty, Pat Doherty's still my friend, the mayor and the lobbyists is because it's the same pattern and that we'll see again. You see, the lobbyist, the political operative, works on the campaign for free in the white world. In exchange for working on the campaign for free, and he has all the tools in the toolbox. He has the voter access. He has information. He has all the tools in the white boy handbook. That operative elects an elected official. In this case, it was the mayor, Mayor Tobolsky. At the point in which he elects the mayor, then the mayor now owes him and the lobbyists. The lobbyists want to put their guy in the administration so if anything changes, they never have to talk to the elected of the mayor. They just talk to their guy. Quite frankly, think about it. In, in the real world, how many people do, how many real powerful people do the work? They have all the people underneath that do the work and they take the credit. So if you know to build a relationship with the people underneath, then guess what? Then you win coming and going. Now, this story that I'm telling you will be applicable to ComEd, right? This same thing is what Mike McClain did to ComEd. So today when you saw the, the subpoena for Mr. Nice in Marionette Park, it was because, guess what? Mr. Nice was a political operative who helped the mayor or the speaker or an elected official in Marionette Park, right? Who then got a contract and went back, got a contract for his help in Marionette Park. So now ComEd has to pay that operative a consulting fee, very similar to the same thing that we saw uh, in McCook, 
except for it was a $4,500 fee. So now that you understand how this works, every time you see the story where it says there was a political operative, there was an elected official, and there were lobbyists, I want you to remember this story. Now I gotta do something. Because y'all know I'm a lobbyist, right? But I'm not that kind of lobbyist. There are good lobbyists and there are bad lobbyists, right? Now don't get me wrong, lobbyists are mercenaries and we go to the highest bidder, oftentimes. Contract lobbyists, so I, I wanna be clear. I am a contract lobbyist. There are issues that I work on that may, people may not like. However, I try to make the best part of them. The difference between what I am talking about as a lobbyist and what we are hearing here is these people create situations to fix so that they can get paid. So imagine, let me just give you, let me just, let me just, can I, can I help y'all with safe speed real quick? Mm -hmm. Just so I give y'all some math. Can I give you just a little bit of math? Just a little bit. Can you imagine having to pay $10,000 a month to people for three years. So what's that? 10,000 times 12 is 120. So over a quarter of a million dollars you had to pay to protect your business from Illinois politicians. And then once you got that paid, then you had to make, they hit them up for campaign contributions, for mayors, managers, all of that. And then they shook them down again to pay the operatives. Now, I'm going to be clear with you. There is no company that comes up and says, I decide that I want to pay a quarter of a million dollars to protect myself. The reason that the lobbyists are deployed into the companies in this case, and what you'll see is what Sandoval tried to do was mimic what he saw Madigan and those guys do. So I want you to watch the small fries and the big fries because there's a parallel situation. See, all of the Sandoval, Reyes, Roosevelt Group, etc., I'm alleging that they learned the way to do business from the white boys. They just did it on a smaller scale. Yeah, it's real in the field out here. It's like, again, I'm going to tell you, they're going to do it to multiple companies. Multiple companies. Right now, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to see them do it to the sweepstakes machines. Now, let me tell y'all something. I'm telling you this because there are things happening where black folks have an opportunity to take over, to, to really take a space. But again, white folks figure out a way to thwart us in our efforts. But it works the best when, what kind of company do you have to be for them to get you? You got to be controversial. See, even as we speak, see, I, I, leverage is important. And I'm going to tell you, that we should turn certain crises into opportunity. But I want to be clear that we should not be victimized by the people that are supposed to be legislating, legislating us. Now, what you didn't, what I didn't tell you was at that meeting when I went to, now this meeting with Sandoval, which was what I started with, where I first saw my friend. And I, so you know how you think your friend is only your friend? And then you go somewhere else and you be like, dang, you his friend too? And you his friend too? And you his friend too? It was during this, guys, it was during this process, it was during this process that I learned how the system worked. The reason that there aren't a lot of black lobbyists is because it would allow black folks to be able to raise their own money and not have to do the bidding 
of the white guys. So basically what the, what the speaker does is he makes sure that black people are dependent on white lobbyists for success. So he can always guarantee the black vote. See, if you if all the black elected officials relied on black money and black lobbyists, then the black lobbyists would take care of black elected officials. And then they wouldn't have to do what the speaker wants them to do. So instead, what he has decided to do is empower the white guys to help the black guys. So when you go to Springfield, what you see is all the, all the black lobbyists sitting down making $2,500 a month while the white boys are building dispensaries, are got all types of different access. Are, while they're lobbying, they're taking their lobbying opportunities to make themselves wealthy. It is. Well, it is 8.09, so I guess we'll have to stop it there. Is it legal? Uh, it, it is. It's legal because the people doing it write the laws. They write the laws so they don't break them. Right? So, if I am, again, if I am the speaker and my guys are doing this, I'm going to write the law so they can get right up to the line. And as long as you get right up to the line without crossing it, I mean, think about it. We have our elected officials who can simultaneously raise our taxes and cut them at the same time. That's acceptable. So when you read and you see what is happening to us in Chicago, understand, like y'all got to read past these damn news stories. You have to stop. Look, the tri the Sun Times or the Tribune gave you a string map that I gave you in October, they gave it to you last week. And they didn't... I, my map told you about Mike. But see, now you understand the McCook. How did the lobbyists... Now, the McCook situation, now you understand McCook, Bondra, mm -hmm. Tobolsky, Doherty, and the lobbyists. Do you understand how they all work together? Now, you can pick that whole same thing up and take it to every one of those municipalities. Now, here's the real deal. What's going to really happen is when they start talking about the lawyers. Now, I haven't decided what I'm going to break down next week. Uh, but I am going to... I mean, this thing is getting super hot. Um, I want to encourage you all to go back to the Chicago Defender and read Illinois Minotti. Um, real quick and before I go, I just want to say... Uh, I just want to know what y'all thought about Rob Begoyevich getting out. I thought that was pretty dope. Um, I think Rob Begoyevich is going to put a lot of people in a trick bag. Uh, I think that Rob Begoyevich is going to put a lot of people in a trick bag. I think the governor is going to be in a jam uh, because he doesn't know what else is on those tapes, and they were plotting together. All right? I mean, think about it. They were talking about Rob went to jail, the governor became the governor. They were talking about the Jesse White seat. They were contemplating it. So who was involved in the horse trading? Um, I'm going to... Somebody told me that they believe that part of this was part of... You know what? I'll save it for the audio podcast. <laughs> so on that note, we're going to wrap it up this week. Uh, we'll wrap it up this week, but I will take some questions. Uh, I got about, I'll give you about six minutes for questions and then I'm going to get out of here. Uh, anybody out there? First of all, let me send some shouts out. Well, did I have anybody watching me tonight? Was anybody with us? I mean, I know y'all be like, we ain't got nothing to do. All right, let me say what's up to Brother Pata. Let me see who's out here. I know. What's up? What's up, Christiane? What's up, Devin? Uh, what up, Brother Edward? What up, uh, Alvin Norton? What up, Yvonne? What up, Marvin Bell? What up, Deacon? What up, Tucson? <clears throat> what up, Regina Gibson? What up, Liz Vinson? What up, uh, Thomas Watson? What's up, Sonia Escobar? What is up, Constance Foster? Hey, y'all. Y'all got any questions? Anybody got questions? Y'all know in a minute, I'm going to get a Google number next week, and we're going to take phone calls. I'm going to get Google number, and we're going to take phone calls for next week. 
Any questions? Any questions? Was I helpful? Did y'all did y'all get anything from that? Do y'all even like the Illinois Minority Podcast? Can you, if you do, can you tell your friends? Can you share it? Can you like it on Facebook? You know what I'm saying? Hey man, I don't like that view. I want to know about that Western lawyer, Western suburbs. Oh, you want about the lawyer in the Western suburbs? Mm, the lawyer in the Western suburbs who actually introduced the mole to all of the people. Mm-hmm. Boy, you want to know that? You want to know? Who, you want to know who the Western suburban lawyer is? Boy. Now, if I told you the Western Suburban Lawyer is, I might have to kill you then. Huh. So maybe let me think about it. So who do y'all want to know? Who do you want to be revealed? Can I ask y'all, is there any questions? Are there anybody you want me to, is there any situation you want me to break down? This is what I want you to do. I want you to go to the Facebook page, go to the Illinois Minority Events page, or to the Maze Jackson page, and tell me what you'd like to break down. One of these shows, I'm going to do straight question and answer. Like, just straight question and answer. Straight question and answers. All right, y'all. Y'all got anything else? Any questions? Any thoughts? Any comments? All hearts clear? Hold on. Let me check. Can y'all take a moment and share the broadcast? Hey, I'm looking for sponsors for the podcast. I'm looking for sponsors for the podcast. Go back to this cut. I'm looking for sponsors for the podcast. I'm looking for sponsors for the podcast. I'm telling y'all now, there's nobody bigger, badder, Telling the most dirt on Facebook and on the internet than your man Maze Jackson. If you want to understand what's happening in Chicago, then you in Illinois politics, you need to holler at me. Look, I also want to take this thing on the road. Once we get together in the house, I want to take the podcast on the road. And I want to come to your town. I want to come to Champaign. I want to come to Peoria. I want to do this bad boy in Springfield. Like Springfield. Okay. Also, be on the lookout for the Western for the Black People Voters Guide, which is on the way. Hey, y'all, this is your man, Maze Jackson. I'm about to sign out because I got to go home and get ready for tomorrow. Um, this has been an awesome podcast. I appreciate you. So, for my crew, Miss Sonia Escobar, Big Swill, mm-hmm. Big Greg G. Greg, Greg Thomas. Greg Thomas? I know it was Greg Thomas. I know I was just making sure I had it right. All right, y'all, tune in next week. This is Illinois Minotti. The podcast. Tonight we were piecing the puzzle together. Doherty Tobolsky and the lobbyists. Do you remember? Y'all remember all them names? Oh we. Alright, well, y'all. Yeah, I'm about what y'all making y'all faces for? Who well, who all upset? People wanna know what's going on. Y'all wanna know what's going on? Yeah. Then you gotta tune in next week, brother. You got to tune in next week. Hey, y'all, it's your man, Mace Jackson. You know, I think I want to do a live studio audience in about two more weeks. Two more weeks, let's do a live studio audience. Let's have some noise. Let's get it cracking. All right, y'all, it's your man, Mace Jackson. Tune in tomorrow, 6 to 9 a.m. on the WVON Morning Show. Until next week, it's your man, Mace Jackson. It's Illinois Minotti. We are inside Illinois' political secret society. There's nobody. Nobody, look, I had, can I just tell y'all one more thing, and then I'm going to quit. I was on the phone with a reporter today, and the reporter was like, man, I learned so much from listening to you. And I was like, but you're a reporter. And he was like, I know, but it's like, you've been there, you've done that. We just know what people tell you, right? People tell you what they heard, I tell you what I know, or at least what I allege I know. And for the people telling me, ooh, the feds gonna call me, they ain't gotta call me. All they gotta do is just listen to the podcast. I'm told you what I know. Talk Chicago. It's your man, Maze Jackson. If you don't like it, you know what you could tell them? You could tell them, Maze said, I'm out of here. Peace. Hit that up in the top corner.